studying the Bible, you always want to make sure you look at the context of what's going on. So uh, we're looking at Ephesians. So we took two weeks to really break down Ephesians, who was writ wrote the letter, where he wrote it from, and why he wrote the letter. So who wrote the letter was the Apostle Paul. We found a couple things curious about the Apostle Paul. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was very highly educated. He was a persecutor of the church. He was the only apostle not to have a personal, uh, in-touch relationship with Jesus Christ. All of his revelation come from the Holy Spirit, not from Jesus directly. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. He spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, and, uh, uh, and Greek, which made him especially capable of fulfilling his position as the apostle to the Gentiles. Who was he writing it to? The original, the oldest manuscripts, doesn't say anything about uh, Ephesus. So the original manuscripts, were actually this letter was meant to be a circular letter. So what they would do is they would take Jesus' writing, they would interpret them, and then they would come up with church doctrine. This is one of what we call the prison epistles. The Apostle Paul was on house arrest. He was able to write letters and have visitors. See, if the Apostle Paul hadn't been on house arrest, he would have never wrote this letter. He would have visited in person. So now we have the letter. So later on, they, when they begin to, to, to translate this and rewrite it, they added to the church in Ephesus. But this letter was actually meant to surround to go from church to church to church from the Apostle Paul. Now he wrote this letter in about 62 AD, which was about 30 years into his ministry. Now why was the letter written? It was to establish our position in Christ. A person cannot act any differently than how they see themselves. In other words, if I see myself as an addict, and at one time I was an addict, if my perception of myself is an addict, I will always act accordingly to how I see myself. That's my issue with AA. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not an addict. Jesus said that I am a saint. There's nothing special that I got to do to be a saint. All I got to do to be a saint is to accept Him as my Lord and my Savior. But we want to be tied down with the baggage of everything. I shared a post of something that said that nor things present nor things to come shall separate us from the love of God. The one thing that can separate you from the love of God is your past. If you hold on to the identity of when you are in sin, you will never be able to walk in the fullness of Christ. Let me tell you why we're ashamed to share our testimony. Because we still see ourselves in our sin. I'm not ashamed that I was in prison. Why? Because I'm not the man that I was that led me to prison. I'm not ashamed of the things that I've done. Sometimes, do they bother me? Absolutely. But I realize that God has transformed me out of darkness into a marvelous light. It's a wonderful thing to know that no matter what man may think of me, what God thinks of me is much, much more important. So our identity in Christ is one of the points. The first three chapters of Ephesians is about our identity in Christ. And then the last three chapters is addressing our behavior. How do we act as a Christian? What's proper? What's not proper? All of this ties together with the idea of the unity of the body of Christ. Man, we are, as a, as a whole, the body of Christ is splintered. We got a church right down the road that's doing a great work we don't have anything to do with because they believe this and we believe that. We should be working on what we do believe that Jesus Christ came, He died, He was buried, He rose again on the third day and through accepting His blood that was shed on Calvary's cross that I can be a son and a daughter of the living God. You know, and come on down here and get you a little bit of the Holy Ghost. You might change your mind on the cessation doctrine. It also talks about spiritual warfare, specifically witchcraft. We also see 
that Ephesus was really struggling with two main sins. The same sins that we're struggling with today. Witchcraft and fornication. We see this temple, this one of the seven wonders of the world, this temple to this goddess Arminius, this way back then, right? This goddess was considered asexual. I'm like, okay, what does asexual mean? And then I begin to look at what we're struggling with today. Our kids, homosexuality is just pushed at them from every avenue. There's $10 million in Pelosi's bill to go to Pakistan for gender identification. Did y'all know that? Yes. Okay, we got a COVID re relief bill and let's just write $10 million to Pakistan so they can figure out that they are not born what they were born to be. Why? Because they're struggling with the same sin. The same sin. It's not changed. The, thing, the only thing that's changed is access, right? Just two clicks away. But the sin hasn't changed. Access has changed. Hollywood promotes fornication. Who would ever thought one of the richest men in the world would have owned an island that he took 12 and 13 year old girls to to molest? Who would ever thought that we would ever see anything like that in our most, the richest, most powerful men in the world have visited the island? Who would have thought we could ever see something like that in today's time? Welcome to Hollywood. The music industry promotes witchcraft. It's crazy. What about Beyonce's uh, uh, alternate personality, Sasha Fierce? Anybody, you know what that is? That's a demon that overtakes her before she performs. The music industry is full of witchcraft. And don't tell me, man, I used to love getting high and listening to Comfortably Numb. I, I never would though. I never would. Hell's bells and highway to hell. I'm like, no man. No, I ain't doing that. <laughs> no, nope, I ain't going to hell. I know hell's real. We're going we to change the real. Y'all going to have to cut that off. <laughs> <laughs> Last week we talked about the, the, the uh, in Revelations, the second chapter, how that the church at Ephesus had left its first love. They were feeding the hungry. They were clothing the naked. They were doing everything that they were supposed to do. They were so involved with the ministry, they forgot their intimate relationship with God. He said, you have left your first love. Let me tell you something. You can do all the good works you want to. There's a lot of pagan. There's a lot of people that don't know God that do some great things in this world. But the most important thing you can offer somebody is not food, is not clothing, is not a safe place to stay, but giving them the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is not first in your life, how can you ever express to somebody else the importance of Jesus being first in their life? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So the other prison epistles is Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. But well, let's look at the first verse. Let's break it down. We're going to break every verse in Ephesians down one at a time. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ. So did he point out that there was like three or four saints in the church of 500? No, he called every believer in Ephesus a saint. Now I know according to the, the Roman Catholic uh, religion, it's not a Roman Catholic, it's not Christianity, it, it's, a, it's a religion. Jesus isn't their savior. I don't know how else to say it. It's not right. I know they got an idea for sainthood. But according to this, God's idea for sainthood is for me to accept Him as my Lord and Savior. 
So Paul wrote this letter to Ephesian believers and all other believers to give them an in-depth teaching about how to nurture and maintain the unity of the church. If I don't know my position in the body of Christ, I cannot be united with my brothers and sisters in the same local congregation. Does everybody understand? See, God didn't call you and save you and drag you out of the ditch of despair for you to ride a pew. God called you to a position. You know what the problem we have in the world today is church attenders instead of people that are dedicated and ready to work for God and to win the loss for the Lord. They're Secular positions are much more important than their calling in the kingdom of God. Yes. <clears throat> One of uh, uh, the Apostle Paul's trips to Ephesus in Acts 19, he addresses witchcraft uh, and the importance of avoiding occultic items. I've actually had a couple people come to me about some strange things going on in their homes. Well, we, they call them poltergeists. We call them familiar spirits, but they are real. They can get attached to things. They can get attached to dwelling places. Some people think it's crazy. You've got all these ghost chasers. They're not chasing ghosts. They're chasing demons. And they get attached to things. Well, this happened in Acts the 19th chapter. So things in your home like the statues of Buddha, dream catchers, Fictional books such as Harry Potter, Vampire Diaries, etc. See, you had these sons of Sceva. They were trying to cast out devils and demons. And what they would do is they would begin to call the different deities. They had noticed that the Apostle Paul had a lot of success when he called out a demon in the name of Jesus. So they tried to do it. And the demon looked at him and said, Jesus, I know. The Apostle Paul, I know. But who are you? And then beat the clothes off of them. And then after the people begin to see this, they were, see, because in Ephesus, what was it? You had that temple, one of the seven wonders of the world. I think it was a, a, a one and a half football fields long and one football field 150 yards by 100 yards wide. Big stone marble columns. It was magnificent. They would have these huge, just crazy things going on in there. And they had these silversmiths that built and created these idols and sold them. It was a big part of their economy. You would have to actually offer uh, uh, homage to Caesar as a god before you could go into the marketplace to buy something. You know, it's much like the mark of the beast. You would have to do, you would have to say, hey, you're my god. I honor you as a god. You're just a man. But I need lettuce. I need chicken. I need some, some groceries. So I'm going to honor you as a God so I can go in the store and buy food. That's how bad it was. Well, after this happened, a revival broke out. And they began to take all their occultic idols. And it says the value was 50,000 pieces of silver. That's what we would refer to as $5.5 million in today's currency. We seen a couple of weeks ago a young man rip a satanic shirt off. And I left the shirt here and I took it home. You know what I did with it? I burned it. Why? Because that's what they did. We want to intermingle light and darkness, but what fellowship does light have with darkness? It says, woe to those that call good evil and evil good. So looking at that, uh, verse 1, faithful in Christ. What an excellent reputation. Such a label would be an honor for any believer. What would it take for others to characterize us as faithful followers of Christ Jesus? Let me tell you, hold fast to your faith. One day at a time, faithfully obey God, even in the details of life. Then, like the Ephesians, we will be known as persons who are faithful to the Lord. You know, we, we have to develop character, right? You know, I know uh, we grow up and, and sometimes we develop things that are uh, opposite of character. I know uh, a lot of the folks that we have worked with, they, 
years of, um, of addiction. They develop some bad habits. It, it, it's, they, don't just, they don't just go away overnight. That character has to be developed. A, a child doesn't know how to act unless he has a parent teach him how to act. Well, a person, when they get begin born again, they're born again as spiritual babes. They have to grow up spiritually. They have to understand that to renew their mind, to lay aside every weight and sin, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their mind so that they can grow up and establish themselves in God. But what do a lot of churches want to do? I'm going to pick you apart for this. Mom, you got to get rid of it. You can't do that. You can't do this. I'll tell you what you do. You do whatever you think the Lord will allow you to do. And when the Holy Spirit starts dealing with you about it, come to your pastor. I'll help you through it. That's the way I'm going to do things. I'm just going to love the sin straight out of you. Mark's grinning from ear to ear. So mm -hmm. you experience that firsthand. <laughs> So verse 2 says, grace and peace from God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we, we got grace all mixed up. We think grace is an excuse to sin. Well, God's going to forgive me, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. That's not grace. That has nothing to do with grace. So let's take a look at the word grace. It's the merciful kindness by which God, exerting His only influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to exercise of the Christian virtues. Grace is the favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to His call to become children of God. This is my favorite definition of grace. The imputed power of God every believer receives at salvation to progressively overcome their desire to sin. It's the imputed power of God. Without God in your life, you can not control your desire to sin. You just can't do it. You mean, what you're going to do is you're going to control one sin and pick up another sin. And the devil don't care what kind of sin you pick up as long as you're holding on to something. <clears throat> so what is peace? I mean, people have teenagers. <laughs> Listen, sometimes they, they challenge our peace. Of Christianity, it's the tranquil state of soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort it is. It's security, safety, prosperity, felicity, because peace and harmony make and keep things safe and prosperous. So peace is not the absence of trouble. It's a calm state in the middle of trouble. It said, be of good. It said, you're going to have tribulation. God, God is not going to remove you from the storm. He is going to strengthen you in the storm. It is the storms of life that we need. I've said this many times, but listen, it is not prosperity that brings revival. The prosperity of this nation has just destroyed the move of God. It is persecution that brings revival. And persecution is coming upon this country. And you may be saved and doing everything right, but when it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. But let me tell you, God will not forsake you. He will keep you. You may not know when it's coming tomorrow, but it will always show up if you belong to Him. So verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. My boy, this is a scripture. The biggest issue we got, let me, Josh told me this story. He said somebody prophesied over him. Let me, let me get, I got me a scripture right here. <clears throat> So he told him, he said, uh, within five years, you're going to have two babies, a house, and 20 acres of land. 
Did I get it right? No. Okay. Now, is that a spiritual blessing? No, that's a natural blessing. Let me tell you what a spiritual blessing is. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, I'm reading this out of the Amplified, the result of His presence within you is love. That, that's what I need. I need some love. Which means unselfish concern for others. Joy, which is inner, inside joy. Even when I don't feel good, I still have it joy. Even when my kids, so that's a spiritual blessing. See that the house is a natural blessing. Peace, patience. Now get this, I love the way the Amplified describes patience here. Not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. That's patience. See, we can wait because we ain't got no choice. Right? But how we act while we wait demonstrates whether we have patience. I don't need, I'm happy with my minivan. I don't need a new car. I need some patience. That's the spiritual blessing. See, we're trying, we're getting it flipped up. We've got our minds so fixed on what's going to go up in a puff of smoke. We cannot see what God is trying to bless us with that's going to keep us when things begin to go up in smoke. Yeah. Kindness. I really need some of this. <laughs> Sometimes I'm not very kind. Goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, Lord help me, self-control. Those are spiritual blessings. That's when my spirit grows and begins to dominate my natural man. Amen. And when I'm a spiritual babe, I'm going to, I mean, well, how, do, how do toddlers act? They're selfish, right? Spiritual babies are selfish. We just have to love them, encourage them, pull them along, slap them every now and then. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We get it, we get it mixed up. And we have entire mega churches that are having so mixed up. They're all about materialism and they how do they explain you cannot serve God and money? What do they do with a guy that said, hey, I got too much stuff. I'm going to tear down my little barns and build bigger barns. He said, this night your soul shall be required of thee. And then what good is that big barn going to do you? What about the rich young ruler? He said, Lord, I've done all that. I've kept all the commitments. And Jesus, having compassion on him, turned around and he said, sell everything you got and give it to the poor. The rich you run, you look. He dropped his head and walked away because he was a man of mighty, mighty wealth. So he chose wealth. Man, we, we're mixing it. We're trying to mix the natural and the spiritual. Yes, God doesn't want you broke. God wants to bless you, not so you can have, so you can be a blessing. It flows through us. It don't stop with us. How many people have ever drank stale water? I mean, pine water. What happens? But you can take that water coming down off the hill that's growing over the stones. It's the most pure, the most clean wine because it's flowing. God cannot Bless an unyielding vessel. So that's spiritual blessings. <clears throat> so 3 John 2, I started off, that was my, my scripture. It says, I pray that you may prosper and be in health. How many, we need good health, right? I sleep in three hours a night because my wrist hurt. I need, I need help. I need something. Somebody do something. If, I, if my thumb wasn't so important, the most used body part on my body, I would cut it off. I would take I would just chop it off. But uh, I need my thumb. Uh, but we need to be in health. But what does it mean for your soul to prosper? 
See, we're spiritual beings created in the image and likeness of God that possess a soul, right? So I'm a spirit being. I belong to God. I'm created in the image and likeness of God that possess a soul. What is my soul? It's my mind, my will, and my emotions. As my mind, my will, and my emotions begin to lean toward the spiritual, toward the love, the peace, the kindness, the goodness, the self-control, the forbearance, toward the fruit of the Spirit, as my mind begins, my soul begins to lean that way, then I begin to spiritually prosper and be in health. Because why? Let me tell you something. 90% of all illnesses are psychosomatic. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You think you're sick, I promise you, you can think yourself very, very ill. It's been proven time and time again. How many birds do you know that have two nests? What you think about that? He said, take no thought for tomorrow. No. He said, consider the birds. How they don't toil. How they don't do anything. But they only have one nest. How many weeks worth of manna did God provide? One day. That's what I'm trying to, when we look at this scripture, the thing that I pull out of this scripture is to stop trying to intermingle the natural and the spiritual. And understand the spiritual flows into the natural so that we can then take the resources and flow them back into the work of God. Verse 4. Now this is where it really starts to get crazy. And you got some really opposing doctrines. And I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the earth, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Matthew twenty-two fourteen 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. So we see this word chose. Chose us. So He chose me before He ever said, Let there be light. He chose me. He chose Josh. He chose Mark. He chose every one of us. And it said many are, it said here, in, it said many are called, but few are chosen. What are the chosen? The chosen are the ones that answer the call. Paul says that God chose us to emphasize that salvation depends totally on God. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. It is only through faith that you are saved, not by works. What did Martin Luther do? He's climbing up this temple on his hands and knees. And his knees are hurting. They're probably bloody. I'm sure there's many steps going up this temple. Something that the monks did every year. And he said God spoke to him and reminded him of a scripture that he was saved by faith and not by works. And everything changed when Martin Luther took 99 eats and stapled them and nailed them to the church wall. And said, I will not do this anymore. He said, your indulgences are crazy. Y'all know what a Catholic indulgence is, don't you? Well, let me tell you. Let me explain to you what a Catholic indulgence is. A Catholic indulgence is that I intend on sin. I'm going to sin. I know that I'm going to sin. It's premeditated. So what I do is I take the priest some money so he can cover my sin ahead of time. That is indulgences. Yes, that's the Catholic Church. Now, I don't know if they still do that. God, I hope not, but you never know. <clears throat> I don't mean to be railing on the Catholics. There's a lot of folks in that organization, uh, in that government. It's not a church, it's a government. They got lots of money. The most powerful government in the world, if you really want to know the truth. We did not influence God's decision to save us. Save us. He saved us according to His plan. So thus there is no way to take credit for our salvation or to allow room for pride. The mystery of salvation originated in the timeless mind of God long before we ever existed. 
Verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Predestined. Now here we go. Now what you got is you got the Baptist idea of once saved, always saved. And I'm going to tell you something. This old jacked up preacher believes you can only be saved one time. But I do believe, and I'm going to show you clearly in Scripture, that that salvation is going to be lost. I'm even going to show you a video at the closing of this that how someone loses the salvation. If he was ever saved, this comment that he makes on this video will show you that he defied everything that the gospel is and begin to accept pagan religions as a way to reconcile with God. He committed the sin of apostasy. So we look at John Calvin. John Calvin propagated an idea that, that God had laid everything out. It, it, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter that you were stamped ahead of time. Everybody, when they were born, were either born to eternity with God or born to eternity in hell. That's the Calvinist idea. When this guy Arminius come along, he said, no, it is self-will. It is free will. Let me tell you something. In between both of them, we find the correct doctor. Let me explain it to you. God is sovereign. He exists outside of time. He sees you from the beginning and to the end all at once. God knows whether you're going to make it or not. I don't know whether you're going to make it or not. So my job as a pastor, your job as a Christian is to preach the gospel and to show the gospel and to demonstrate the gospel to everyone. The problem is, is I'm trying to wrap my mind around the mind of God. I got to get my nose out of God's business. <clears throat> Predestined means marked out beforehand. This is another way of saying that salvation is God's work and not of our own doing. And we also talk about, we look at that word adoption. They use this because as a Roman citizen, the adopted child receives all the rights, all every right as a natural child. So, it, you know, in, uh, I have two adopted kids. I have Sarah, we got her when she was two days old, and we got Christian when he was two days old. They're just as much my kids. Let me tell you something, Morgan is just as much my kid. Valerie is just as much my kid. Brittany's is just as much my kid as my kids are. They may have come later in life, they may be in their 20s, but they are still, I promise you, just as much mine and Marilyn's kids. So let's look at predestination. In Christian theology is the doctrine that all events have been willed by God, usually with reference to the eventual fate of the individual soul. Explanations of predestination often seek to address the paradox of free will, whereby God's omniscience seems incompatible with free will. Get this. Unconditional election is considered to be one aspect of predestination in which God chooses certain individuals to be saved. Man, I don't like the way that sounds, do you? God chooses. No, salvation is for everyone, for anyone that answers the call. But this is where you get the root of the idea of once saved, always saved. This is Calvinist. This is Reformed theology. And a lot of the things they say is right. A lot of the things Arminius said was right. I think the truth falls in the middle. And I fix and try to do my best to explain the truth. Number one, <clears throat> we have to understand that God in Scripture changed his mind several times. What happened when, when Moses was up in the mountain and God said, get down there. They have built a golden calf with the gold that I had the Egyptians God saying, I can't believe they're doing this. I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to start a whole new people from you. Most God said that. You can look, and I ain't got time to read it, Exodus 32, 7 through 14. <coughs> Moses began to pray on behalf of the people. And then it said something strange. It said God repented of what he thought to do. What do you mean God repented? What is repentance? Repentance in Greek comes from two words, mea and noia. 
It means an altering of the way you think. In some modern translations, it'll say relented. God stopped. But God actually had one thing He intended to do. He told Moses He was going to destroy them. Moses prayed and God changed His mind. We see it all through Scripture. What about Psalms 106, 43, and 45? Many times He delivered them, but they rebelled in their counsel and they were brought low for their iniquities. Nevertheless, He regretted their affliction and when He heard their cry and for their sake, He remembered His covenant and relented according to the multitude of His mercies. If you read the King James Version, it said He repented according to the multitude of His mercies. And so how do we wrap that? How do we, how do we, how do we reconcile free will, predestination, God existing out, uh, outside of time, <clears throat> reconcile it with Isaiah 55, 8, 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as much as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't wrap our mind around a smidgen of the way God thinks. And we're just not going to have it all figured out. Anybody that tells you they got all of it figured out, you don't need to listen to that preacher. I don't care how smart they think they are. It is impossible for our limited minds to fully comprehend the mind of God. Faith is following Him regardless of our limited understanding. So let's skip on down to the once saved, always saved versus the uh, possibility of loss of salvation. Now I remember when I was a kid, we'd have revival and the same people would get saved every year. <laughs> like, when did y'all not get saved last time? <laughs> so it gives us the idea that somehow we can become saved and then become unsaved and then get saved again. But I can't find any example of that in Scripture. So, and I do believe that the biggest issue that we have is that we're so quick to count salvations like I used to count car sales when I ran a car lot. I would declare the car was sold, right? Sometimes we don't declare people saved. I could walk into the Walker County Jail tomorrow and man, I could lead a hundred people in the sinner's prayer. When they get out of jail, 99 out of the 100 are going to go right back to the garbage that got them in jail. Now you tell me, were they saved? We've got to see fruit bearing the idea of repentance. So, and I'm not trying to discount the sinner's prayer. I'm not trying to discount salvation. But when you see Billy Graham declare that 70,000 people got saved, I have to think, well, let me follow 70,000 of these people around for six months and see if there's any fruit. Because if there is no fruit, there never has been any root. And you can't tell me you have a relationship with an almighty God and nothing changes in your life. We got people running around here out right now thinking that because they got baptized when they was 13, that somehow that they're saved. Living like hell for 30 years. One of my, my best friends, she's got to be 40 years old. Her, her husband and I are like brothers. She grew up in the church of God. Worship leader. 40 years old, something happened. She got saved. Multiple demons come out. I mean, million dollar house. Everything educated. $300,000 a year job. Everything. She just never got saved. She was just raised in church. Multiple demons come out of this person. And then she began to tell of how many different affairs she had had over the years kind of she had a, a lustful demon. I thought she was saved. <laughs> I thought she had a relationship with God. But we don't know, do we? <clears throat> so let's take a look at a couple of scriptures that 
demonstrate that salvation can be lost. I'm going to read through these real quick, play the video, and then we can go home. Mark 3.29, this is the pivotal scripture. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit has never... Listen, he who blasphemes the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. There's no way to get the forgiveness. But it's subject to eternal condemnation. The question is, is what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Number one, let me tell you something. If you do not have a relationship with God, you cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You've got to be saved in order to commit this sin. And talking against the Holy Spirit is not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. The guy down the road that don't understand tongues, that says tongues is another devil, he's not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's not what it is. So let's look at it. So let's go to Hebrews 4, or Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Now get this, where this starts. For it is impossible. What does impossible mean? No possibility, right? There is no possibility. For those who were once enlightened. Now we're going to see five parenthetical phrases. These are phrases meant in a sentence to drive a point home. So you've got to understand that what we're talking about here is God is inspiring this scripture. He's going to use five phrases to emphatically describe a person that has a relationship with God. Get this. Who were once enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. So here I got this person that God describes with five phrases that emphatically says they have a relationship with God if they fall away. Now I got to look at that script, that word right there, fall away. See, that's actually one word, one Greek word. It means apostasy. It is a root word for apostasy. So apostasy is something that's really important. I need to understand it. And we're fixing to show you a real live example of Billy Graham and his apostasy in the end of his days. To renew them again into repentance. So if they fall away, if they go the way of the apostate, they cannot come back. So they can be saved. They can lose their salvation by going the way of the apostate. And they are damned for hell. They have blasphemed the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to do what? To convict the world of their sin. To reconcile mankind with God through Christ. Not through Buddha. Not through Allah. But through Jesus Christ. Only one way. Not an Oprah Christ consciousness. But through Jesus Christ the born son of the living God. No other way. But we got this new thing called progressive Christianity. They like the ideas of the Bible, but the Bible's a little outdated. So homosexuality's all right. Let me tell you something. It's not all right. I don't care what that preacher said. I don't care what he has told you. It has got to line up with the Word of God. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. And it will never, ever, ever change. But I'm telling you, it's sweeping the country. Joel Osteen, progressive Christianity. It's not right. It is the falling away that we're fixing to go in a little further. Hebrews 10, 26. Well, let me finish that. Yet they fall away to renew them again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. So you're saved, you become unsaved. God is not going to send His Son to die a second time. For if we, Hebrews 10, 26-31, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. So if I go on sinning, now, the biggest issue is, is we have a lot of people that have had an emotional experience and not a spiritual experience. They don't have a relationship with God. They come up here, they cry, they swing a little snot. They do better for a little while, but they never have been saved. But if they are saved and they go on willfully sinning after they receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Man, I don't think Joel Osteen or Stephen Furtick ever preached this message or this scripture. 
Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace, greasy grace, for we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So he says, if you go on sinning afterwards, and what is the one sin? Well, let's look at Thessalonians uh, 2, 1 and 3. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and together together in Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us, as through the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless there come a falling away first. There's that thing, fall away. Fall, there it is again. That's the apostasy. So what we have right now is we have a large portion of the body of Christ committing an apostasy and departing from the truth, proclaiming that there's other ways to reconcile with God. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In the last scripture, 1 John 5, 16 and 17. If any man see his brother sinning, a sin which, is, which does not lead to death. Now I want you to understand, everywhere in the New Testament, I have preached a lot of funerals, and I have found that everywhere in the New Testament where a believer passes away, it does not say they die, it says they went to sleep. So you need to understand that in the context of the Scripture. It says if we see our brother sinning a sin which is not unto death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. This really describes the importance of intercessory prayer. When we begin to see a brother that is struggling in a sin, we get on our face before God and we pray on their behalf. We don't beat them on the head. We love them. We pray for them. We bind. We loose. We come against darkness on their behalf. We pray for them when we see them straying away. When they stop coming to church. When they're just not as active as they used to be. When you notice their tone changes and their conversation headed in the wrong direction. What do we do? We pray. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped. There is a sin leading to death. I want you to understand this is a spiritual death. This is not a physical death. So there's a sin that leads to spiritual death? Yes. It's apostasy. It's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So let me tell you something. Once saved, always saved is partially right. Unless you commit this sin. See, well, what I don't get is when I'm reading MacArthur's commentary, he doesn't have a whole lot to say about these Scriptures. we got to stop doing that. We can't study the Bible based on on our on the way we were raised. I used to think that sanctification happened all at one time. That somehow God was going to touch me and my desire to sin was automatically going to go away. And that happened for about three hours. <laughs> and then I realized that sanctification was progressive. It was growing in Christ. It required effort. It required proper food, a proper diet. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should pray about that. So when you begin to see what we're fixing to watch, they know you're praying for that person because they're spiritually dead. Jesus Christ isn't going to die for that person again. So that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. All unrighteousness sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. So I want you to... Um, I want y'all to watch this video. This <clears throat> is Billy Graham now. Would you listen to what he says? <coughs> what do you think is the future of Christianity? 
Christianity and being a true believer. You know, I think there's the, the, the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that, that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping uh, revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. I think James answered that, the Apostle James, in the first council in Jerusalem, when he said that God's purpose for this age is to call out a people for his name. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have, and they turn to the only light that they have, and I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. This is fantastic. I'm so proud to hear you say that. There's a wideness in God's mercy. There was a, an interview that was held between Robert Shore and Dr. Billy Graham on the Hour of Power. And the transcript of that conversation, the conversation went like this. Dr. Schur said, tell me, what is the future of Christianity? Dr. Graham said, I think there's the body of Christ, which comes from all the Christian groups around the world, or outside the Christian groups. I think everybody that loves Christ or knows Christ, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're members of the body of Christ. And I don't think that we're going to see a great sweeping revival that will turn the whole world to Christ at any time. In other words, what it's saying is, uh, there are people in the body of Christ who never heard of Christ, uh, so we don't need to expect that they're all going to come to Christ. They're going to come another way. Further, he says, God's purpose for this age is to call out people for his name, and that's what God is doing today. He's calling people out of the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. They are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but they know in their hearts that they need something that they don't have. And they turn to the only light they have, and I think they're saved, and they're going to be with us in heaven. Dr. Shuler responded, what I hear you saying is that it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into a human heart and soul and life, even if they've been born in darkness and have never heard and never had exposure to the Bible. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? Dr. Graham, yes it is, because I believe that. I've met people in various parts of the world in tribal situations. They've never seen a Bible or heard about a Bible, have uh, never heard of Jesus, but they believed in their hearts that there is a God, and they've tried to live a life that was quite apart from the surrounding community in which they live. Dr. Sure, this is fantastic. I'm so thrilled to hear you say that. There is a wideness in God's mercy. Dr. Graham, there is. There certainly is. This is certainly leaked from Aristotle to the Catholic Church and the Evangelical Protestants. Now we have a kind of Protestant viewpoint that says Muslims and Hindus and whoever are going to be in the body of Christ, in the kingdom, in heaven, with salvation, whether they ever get a Bible or whether they ever get a gospel or whether they ever know about Jesus Christ. The uh, program organization affirmed that this position is the same as the one articulated in the article in Decision Magazine, which Billy wrote in 1960, so this is not something new. What do you all mean by that? So basically what he's saying is that there's other ways to reconcile with God. Let me tell you who that says that. Uh, Oprah Winfrey says that. She calls it Christ consciousness. That's impossible. In the middle of predestination, once saved, always saved, and you lose your salvation every time you sin, is the truth. If you are saved and you don't commit apostasy, you'll always be saved. If you don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. So that's the first half of Ephesians 1. We'll finish in a couple of weeks on the second half of Ephesians 1. But um, does anybody got any special prayer requests or anything in closing or need special prayer for any reason? My brother. Brother. Alex, right? Alec. Alec. Yeah. Like a bald one. Yeah. My mom and her boyfriend Tommy, they're traveling 
a long ways tomorrow. What's your mom's name? Karen and Tony. Any other requests? Let's pray for Kenny. I'll stand in. Um, pray for Kenny. He's sick. Yes. <clears throat> Does not feel right without Kenny. No. no. <laughs> well, I don't know if we could have like a human mascot, but he would definitely be some pretty human mascot. <laughs> Keep my parents in your purse. Yeah, Josh's parents. My family. Um, we wrap that down every week. Yeah. We lost uh, um, my mom's nephew. My first cousin died of a heroin overdose. You know, I've just been so shaken up this week. I don't know. It just uh, I get to think about all the people that have just died. They're just dead. Cody Busby, 32 years old. Morgan North, 29 years old. These are people that are friends of mine that I've been to. You know, and they're just dead. Yeah. They're gone. You know, and, and we have the we have the answer. Do we have the answer, Mark? Do we have the answer, Melissa? We have the answer. We've seen lives changed. We gotta do a better job of getting outside the walls of the church. Continue to pray for Jimmy. He's real scared. Has he been moved to a permanent home yet? No, he didn't. He's still at the VA. <clears throat> Keep a Roger uh, Olive. Roger who? Who's him and his family? Roger who? Olive. Olive. Yeah. His uh, his wife's battling with cancer, and uh, their son's dealing with some drug issues, and he's trying to get right. Any other requests? Kevin Boyd and Ashley Boyd and uh, Sandy Maddox. Ash, what Maddox? Who? Mark Scrum. Yes, sir, Maddox. Any other requests? Don't, well, pray for Beth. Some of y'all are probably aware. Uh, I told her she couldn't come back to church. I said, well, Ron, that's pretty harsh on your own daughter. But um, my daddy always told me, he said, he said, Pastor, it's real simple. Love the people at the church as much as you love your family. And she was keeping another family from coming to church. I thought about it. I said, this really sucks, but this is a decision I gotta make. And she's just going to learn things the hard way because she is hard headed. And she needs to yeah. do a little changing, you know. Yeah, but the only way she's gonna change is experience the perfect work of sin. You know, sin has its perfect work, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Fruit has to ripen before mm -hmm. it's picked. Well, so she's got change come. doesn't come until we see how hard it can get. Yep. We see we can't do it alone. And I've always surrender. used to tell people, I said, I don't know what I would do if it was one of my kids. Well, now, I can honestly say I know what I would do. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I tell them, just leave them out there. I've been praying for her, though. She's, she's going to she's gonna get where she needs to be. She is. Let's you know, put she Brandy she... and her family on the prayer Yes, she Brandy and the kids. Yes. Them are some of the sweetest, um, some of the sweetest kids. Yes. Caleb and Abby. Any other requests? Yeah, I prayer about that car so I can get back to work. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Y'all bow your heads with me. Father, as we come before you, Lord, we thank you for this incredible opportunity to get together and to worship and to just learn from your word. Father, we pray that this word just settle deep inside each of us as we just explore the never-ending depth of Scripture. Father, I pray for Alec Marsh, Lord God, that you just touch and convict him. Father, give, send a preacher, send someone in his life that can win him and convince him 
Father, that you are the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Father God, I pray for complete deliverance for Tony and Karen, God, that you keep a hedge of protection around them. Father, that you just protect them, Lord, that you convict them, Lord, that you deliver them and set them free. Father, we pray for little Kenny's healing, God, that you just touch him. God, heal him as you are able. God, I pray for Josh's parents, such a marvelous work you've done in Josh and Abby, God. We're so blessed to have them. But Father, how great of a thing would it be for Josh to be in church with his parents? Father, this is a unselfish request, Lord. Father, we know that ultimately it is their decision, Father, but we know how powerful you can direct our steps. God, I pray for <clears throat> Amber Allison's family, God, that you just move, Lord, that you just touch, God. I pray for Robbie, God, and Jad, and, uh, and Jeremy Parr, Father, as we, as they, and Adam Smalley, God, and the other police officers, God, that you just keep your hand of protection over them, God, as they go out and perform their duty and their careers, Lord, that you just protect them. God, I pray for peace, God, to settle upon Jimmy. Father, such a hard and horrible thing, such a frightening thing for a family man to be so distant, Lord. God, to be in such a strange place and with his mind in the shape that is in, God. But we know that you are powerful enough to settle him. God, I pray for Roger Olive and his family, God. I pray, Lord, God, that you just let sin do its perfect work in his son, Lord God. Bring him to a rehab that can help him, deliver him. For, Ke for Kevin and Ashley Boyd, for Mark's grandmother, God, I just pray that you continue to work on Beth, God, bring her to repentance. God, we know, God, that the storm has to come before deliverance. Yes. Father, we pray, God, that Brandy and the kids be directed in the midst of their storm. God, we thank you for Tammy for coming to here with us, Lord. God, we just pray, Lord, God, that the issues with their car will be fixed easily without any trouble. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Yeah. I promise I'm going to try to teach and not preach one day. <laughs> I just don't know how. <laughs> preaching. Preaching. <clears throat> now, that was preaching. I'm sweating. Yeah, I, I preached. Yeah, you preached. Yeah, there you go. Well, there wasn't no treaty to that. No, it's more than a fucking lady. She told me I did it. I started to get into it. I didn't know if the whole thing was. Yeah. Yeah, those are uh, uh, staples, not nails. Well, it was holding me up. I know it was. Now I went on the floor. I had all that. I'm warm. I had a lot of that. Oh, my God. Did you hear Brooklyn Sunday morning? I did. Oh, Lord.